Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Parliament of the World's Religions Next Generation Task Forces virtual program themed Building Better Together that we have organized in observance of the UN World Interfaith Harmony Week. My name is Kehkesha. I am the youngest trustee of the Parliament of the World's Religions, a member of the Parliament's Next Gen Task Force, and the founder president of Green Hope Foundation. And I am delighted to be your moderator for today. So we are now going through some of the most trying times in living memory, one that has confronted humanity with challenges never seen or experienced before. In the global scale of the pandemic and the speed with which it spread to the farthest corners of our planet is unprecedented. It's been a year now and we are still to emerge from this tunnel of darkness that has dealt immense misery, the magnitude and scale of which has, like all other previous disasters, affected the weak, the vulnerable, and the marginalized the most. Now, the vaccine rollouts give us hope that the recovery process has finally begun. It's therefore an opportune moment to take stock, ruminate, and contemplate with greatest sincerity how we need to proceed. What milestones do we need to set so that we can rebuild better to make our societies and nations more resilient and to ensure that we are never caught unprepared in the same manner in the future. Before we begin the panel discussion, I would like to invite my colleague, Miriam Kizada, to speak to us about the World Interfaith Harmony Week. Miriam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kaksha, and I want to thank all our panelists and, of course, all our guests um, this morning for me, but, you know, joining us from, from different time zones and different parts of the world. Um, we are very excited to host you. As you know, the mission of the parliament is really to foster engagement and dialogue among individuals of faith, communities of faith and spirituality, and, of course, individuals of conscience who really believe that a world that is peaceful, just and sustainable is possible. So we are very excited to be hosting this dialogue um, as part of the global observance of UN World Interfaith Harmony Week. Um, as some of you know, um, but if, if, if many of you don't know, UN World Interfaith Harmony Week was um, established in 2010 um, as a United Nations resolution presented by His Majesty okay. King Abdullah II and His Royal Highness Prince Ghazi bin Muhammad of Jordan. Um, and World Interview Harmony Week encourages grassroots events that link people together in global waves of understanding, respect, and action. Um, the parliament has historically been engaged in World Interview Harmony Week since its inception. Um, we've hosted virtual gatherings in the past. We've hosted physical events in the past. Um, but since 2018, we are uh, we have an inc incredibly honor to receive a grant from the John Templeton Foundation. Um, that has made it possible for us to promote the annual observance to our network and also promote the His Majesty King Abdullah II's World Interfaith Harmony Week Prize, which I will share additional details with you um, at the end of the program. And then I will send additional resources to everyone who attends just so they have it available to them. Um, as as uh, Kakasha was, was very kind to, to point out, this is gonna be a very interactive dialogue. So we're excited to have you here um, and we hope you enjoy it. Kakasha, back to you. Thank you, Miriam. Yes, the World Interfaith Harmony Week has brought all of us together from different parts of the world. And it's wonderful to be a part of such an amazing multidisciplinary and interfaith dialogue. And before we continue, I'd just like to echo what Miriam said, that this is an interactive session. And after we hear from our, our panelists, we would request you to provide your comments and questions so that we can truly take forward this conversation. So to discuss how we can build better together, we have with us today two amazing speakers who will share their insights on this very important topic. We are very pleased to have with us 
Kusumita Pedersen, Member, Board of Trustees, Parliament of the World's Religions, and Professor Emerita of Religious Studies at the St. Francis College, and Pragna Vasubal, Head of Events of Green Hope Foundation. Welcome. I am really happy to speak to both of you today as you bring to the table your unique expertise and experiences in building a more peaceful and just world, and especially during such unpredictable times as seen during this pandemic. Now, 2021 is being heralded as the year of the new normal of building better together towards a brighter future. But we know for a fact that there are still myriad challenges that we need to surmount. So the first question that I'd like to pose to you is, what challenges do you see 2021 bringing with it? And Kusumita, let's begin with you. Thank you so much, Kekashan. And um, it's great to be with you all um, this morning. It's morning in New York City where I live. And um, to have a dialogue on the global crisis. And I, I actually don't consider myself to have special expertise on the global crisis and what, uh, you know, and the questions being posed, but I have some thoughts that I will share. And um, the first thing is, uh, if we're looking ahead to 2021, the pandemic is not over. We could say this is the beginning of the end but um, it won't be over by the end of 2021, I think, are the signs. Um, and uh, we have uh, great issues with making the vaccine available on a just basis, on an equal basis to the pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 is affecting uh, or can affect everyone in the world. And um, so also, there is the question of the variants of the virus and what, uh, what their effect will be. Uh, people are asking whether variants of the virus are going to make the vaccines less effective. So we, we want to be um, very um, realistic uh, when, and, and not to say to ourselves, well, you know, the vaccines are here, so we'll have a vaccine and we'll be OK. Um, and um, one of the challenges that faces us in uh, 2021 and beyond is preparedness um, because the pandemic has been predicted for many years that there would be a pandemic, you know, not the name of the virus, but that there would be another pandemic. And um, there have been several in, in the last few decades. This, this was foretold. And yet we were found uh, to be unprepared, even in um, uh, developed countries. So a great challenge for us is what do we need to do to be ready for, a, let's, let's suppose that uh, a global health crisis and pandemics will be an ongoing phenomenon. <laughs> how can we, here's my question, how can we always be ready not just uh, get over this, but how can we always be ready uh, for whatever uh, will happen, um, speaking of pandemics in particular. And then the effects of COVID-19 uh, itself have been um, millions of people out of work with great hardship as a result. Um, students out of school and out of college and university. Um, and um, for those that are already poor, already um, without access to health care and already without uh, enough food, um, uh, yesterday I was watching a program with Dr. Vandana Shiva at the Temple of Understanding. And she said for people in poverty, COVID has been the last straw. So there's widespread hunger um, that we aren't hearing so much about in a rich country like the United States. And um, so uh, one more thing, um, which is that, um, and I don't feel I have uh, fully understood and we can, can have a conversation about this, 
but there has been, um, a, there's a turning point in awareness of systemic injustice and racism. And what I, I personally don't feel I fully understood though I have some ideas is why did this happen during the pandemic? Um, uh, in the US, it was about two or three months into the pandemic that George Floyd was murdered. And um, it wasn't only in the United States, but in 60 countries across the entire world, there were demonstrations that were set off by the killing of George Floyd. And um, so we have um, a challenge, an awakening, an opportunity, and um, I hope that uh, in this uh, come this year and and after we can rise to the occasion of the call for um, justice for transforming it, systemic injustice. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Kusumita. You bring forth some very important points, especially that the pandemic is not over, that vaccine distribution is definitely not equitable right now. We have to deal with the variants of the virus. And the, it's very sad to note that the pandemic was foretold, but we still still ignored all of the signs and just kept going towards and going about as normal, whereas normal was not enough. We needed something else to ensure that we were able to tackle the inequalities that, as you said, were now exacerbated by uh, the pandemic. So thank you for that. Pragna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kakashan, and thank you so much for having me today. It is truly an honor to be a part of this event. To add on to what my fellow panelists said, 2021 is a crucial year for humanity. The actions we take moving forward will determine our future and communities for the coming decades. The immediate challenge we need to address is stopping the spread of COVID-19 in vulnerable communities. Distribution of vaccines and providing emergency assistance is crucial. I believe that the main challenge, apart from fighting the virus, will be reversing the setback on the SDGs by the pandemic. The COVID pandemic has revealed the gross inequalities in the society, due to which the SDGs have taken a huge blow. It has pushed an additional 88 million people into extreme poverty and added more than 80 million to the total number of people undernourished. UNESCO estimates about 1.25 billion students are affected by lockdowns. The pandemic has re-emphasized the digital divide and the right to access internet access, particularly for those in rural areas. The pandemic has also widened the gender gap. While these statistics are unnerving, they are unfortunately the harsh reality that we live in. Not to mention, due to the pandemic, the climate change crisis has taken a back seat. Global emissions must be cut by almost 8% every year for the next decade to keep the world of the 1.5 degrees Celsius target of the climate agreement. The magnitude of that task has been laid bare by COVID-19. While I have listed quite a lot of challenges, it is hard to decide on one or a few important challenges because all of them are intricately linked with, e with each other. Because truthfully, we have lost the luxury to address challenges one at a time. This is why we need to work on achieving the SDGs because they provide such an elaborate and comprehensive framework to mitigate climate change, reduce inequalities, ensure quality education, and so on. The SDGs are a roadmap for humanity. They encompass almost every aspect of human and planetary well-being, and if met, will provide a stable and prosperous life for every person and ensure the health of the planet. Thank you, Pragna. Yes, you do bring a really very important point, and that is how important the SDGs are and the hit that they have taken due to the pandemic. And a lot of people actually don't know this, but there were 
several targets, I think 21, that had a target date of 2020 instead of 2030, as with the others. And in the targets, which were already behind uh, before the pandemic, these were set back even more due to the pandemic. So we really do need to step up our game and recognize that these challenges cannot be addressed in isolation. We have to recognize their, uh, how interconnected they all are. So thank you once again, Pratna. And both of our panelists uh, today have said that, you know, there are numerous challenges that COVID-19 has uh, posed uh, to us and of course exacerbated inequalities all around the world. But of course it has also served as a wake up call. And we actually have seen progress in certain areas we might not have thought of before. So now I'd like to ask, do you see this pandemic as an opportunity for building better together? Pragna, let's begin with you this time. Thank you so much, Kakashan. The outbreak of the pandemic in 2019 has forced us to question the fragility of our existing systems that we confidently assumed to be strong enough. It has revealed the weaknesses and proved our lack of preparedness. The virus has brought the mightiest countries to its knees, proving to be greater than any national border. And for the first time in years, the world is collectively working towards one goal, beating coronavirus. The speed and intensity with which it changed our lives has provided us the opportunity to reevaluate our values and design a new area of development that truly balances economic, social, and environmental progress as envisioned by the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. However, in actuality, even before the pandemic, we were not on track to achieving the SDGs, emphasizing that we do not have the option to go back to normal because the normal before the pandemic was equally worse. Therefore, we have no other choice but to rebuild better. And the pandemic has provided us this chance, a chance to create a new normal. There is a lot that we can learn from the pandemic. The most important thing is that there is nothing that trumps ensuring the well being of the people and environment. The pandemic also shows us the wisdom of what is already inherent in the SDGs. The challenges we face cannot be dealt with in isolation, as you said. We are at the crossroads of humanity, a critical juncture a time of risks, but also of opportunities that may or may not be seized. When we reflect in 10 years time, tracing the origin of the dynamics shaping interpersonal relations and international relations, it is likely that we look for their origins in the crisis of 2020 and the decisions taken in 2021. The pre-coronavirus world was already deeply unequal and the decisions made in 2021 will either correct or widen those inequalities on multiple levels. This is the time that we as a society need to collectively make conscious decisions. And if we make the right choices, I believe that the pandemic is the perfect opportunity to build back better together. Thank you. Thank you, Pratna. Absolutely, we cannot go back to normal because normal brought us this pandemic and the world has definitely now seen an increase in multilateralism as we are all working towards that common goal as you mentioned thank you for uh, talking about that kusumita the floor is yours kusumita you're on mute Thank you, Pragya, and thank you so much for um, all that you say about the SDGs and us, and especially for mentioning climate change. Um, and for those on the call who um, may want to know more about the SDGs, um, I would say that Wikipedia really has its moments. You know, it can be awful or it can be really great, and <laughs> it all depends. 
the entries on the sustainable development goals will give you all 17 of the sustainable development goals and then it will link you right to the United Nations website, which of course is very, very comprehensive. And um, in the um, environmental movement, uh, the basic principle of ecology is this very thing that everything is interconnected. And Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si says over and over again, everything is interconnected. So all of the um, uh, 17 goals for a sustainable future, and they are, they are, they are include for example, gender equality, um, ending of injustice, caring for life on land, caring for life in water, climate action. And so I refer you to, uh, it's, a, it's a comprehensive program for reaching a world of justice, peace and sustainability by 2030. And the difference between um, these and the Millennium Development Goals is that the sustainable development goals are for every country in the world, not just for so-called underdeveloped countries. I meant to mention that like the pandemic, the catastrophe of climate change was predicted. This has been predicted for decades. So um, the opportunity is, um, as I said, to, to, how to say this, um, are, we need to take decisions and the decisions need to be evidence-based, knowledge-based. And what we have learned is um, that very rapid change is possible if there is commitment, if there is, a, um, if the a situation demands it, if it is an emergency. And the COVID-19 pandemic being um, understood as an emergency has caused governments, scientific institutions, um, and other sectors in society to mobilize very, very quickly. Um, not everyone has, but um, the uh, response to the pandemic has shown that change is possible. And um, broad change, I, 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 I want to stop short of saying systemic change because that's where we want to go. And um, what we um, also have learned is that if we don't choose the change, we will be changed in ways that we have not intended. Change is upon us, change is upon us. And it is up to us to, um, as much as we can, uh, I, I don't necessarily think there will be a stable future or a normal, a normal, <laughs> but, uh, but we want to choose a, a better future rather than a, a future, um, a catastrophic future. So the choice is ours. <coughs> the tricky part about the opportunity of building back together is the word together. So um, the pandemic has displayed inequalities and it's also brought forth what you might even call an affirmation of inequality, um, uh, the, the polarization that's very often referred to and which has uh, uh, um, become a, a very serious issue in the United States as it's come out into the open in a new way. So, but not only in America. So let me leave it at that. It's building back together, the together part, the community part is going to be a challenge, but it's really necessary. Yeah, together is definitely the key word here. Mm. And you're right, the response that we saw directed towards the pandemic, if it is the same kind of multilateralism and cooperation is directed towards solving our other world issues that of course were brought forward and highlighted by the pandemic, and I think we can definitely rebuild together towards that brighter future and towards a new normal. Now, uh, since both of you have spoken about that brighter future and the new normal, what steps do we all need to take to create that new normal for the betterment of our communities, our movement, and of course, for our future? Kusumita, let's begin with you. Thank you, Kekashan. 
um, when you um, uh, invited us to reflect on these questions, uh, I find that this is a, a question that doesn't have any easy answer. Um, I believe we're in a knowledge crisis. And so one of the steps that I would like to see is a partnering of science and religion. Um, but that is part of, a, of the larger crisis over knowledge and truth. And that points to education. And I'm an educator by profession. Um, and I've been to any number of conferences in my life on uh, urgent issues in the world. And almost every conference ended with the resolution that said somewhere that education is the answer or part of the answer. And I'd like to mention a great sage who isn't often mentioned in the interfaith movement, but he's a, a towering figure in China and that's Confucius. And the teachings of Confucius, um, uh, this is the, the axis of, of Chinese civilization in a sense. And Confucius said that to be fully human, we must be educated. We must be cultured, we must be trained, we must be cultivated, and we must learn to discriminate falsehood from truth and the ethical from the unethical. So I'd like to place that before us um, we're in a time where um, uh, social media and the internet enables everyone to go into a bubble where their confirmation bias is completely, um, uh, you know, uh, fed and, and, and is able to grow. Uh, people go on the internet and they will go to a silo or a bubble where only what they already feel and think will be fed to them. So that raises again the, the question of choosing. And um, as a classroom teacher, um, you know, there, there comes a point where teachers are concerned that students think that everything is just opinion, but it's not just students. <laughs> it's vast numbers of people who, um, uh, you know, how do we find our way to what's really true? And the, the term evidence-based is used at the United Nations all the time. So I think that's, um, this educational task and the task of discerning the truth and bringing together science and other modes of knowledge, because of course, as human beings, there are many modes of knowledge that this is urgent for us. Of course, we need to make lifestyle changes and we need to hold our governments accountable to do the right thing. As uh, um, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, some are guilty, but all are responsible. So um, he was another great sage. So each of us is responsible to do um, what's in our power. Yes, absolutely. We all have that responsibility as citizens of our planet. And definitely we need that partnership between science and religion and other ways of thinking because there is no single uh, knowledge base that is there because we are all different. And I completely agree and I'm sure Pregnant Miriam also agreed that, and all of us agree that education gives us the power to distinguish really what is right and wrong between truth and lie and really gives us that empowerment to create a better world and tackle fake news that is you know, brought about by social media, tech, and even just opinion, as you said. So thank you, Kusumita. Uh, Pragna? Well, so and, uh, let me say one more thing. I think this uh, education is lifelong and I think the crisis of knowledge means that the steps we have to take are have to do with the right use of media, including social media, and also the arts, arts and culture. Absolutely. Yes. Couldn't agree more on that. Thank you, Kusumita. Pragna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kekushan. Absolutely. As Kusumita mentioned, one of the first steps to be taken is the partnership of science and religion. And education is a vital role, plays a vital role in implementing that. In addition to that, I believe that it is also important to restructure our social and economic order. In order to do that, we need to bridge the gap and drastically reduce inequalities. We need to be adequately prepared for any future crisis, especially in developing countries where there is already a huge burden of infectious diseases. 
Most importantly, after the pandemic, we need to ensure access to the most basic healthcare infrastructure defined by the World Health Organization. We have been working on providing clean water and sanitation facilities to the villagers in Bangladesh. We have distributed gloves, masks, water filters, and hygiene kits to build resilience against the virus. We have also installed toilets for them and constructed deep bore tube wells so that, we, so that they have a source of clean, arsenic-free water. We also need to implement solutions that ensure public health and economic well-being without jeopardizing the environment. COVID-19 has reminded humans how dependent we are on our ecosystems and the acute connection between human health and our planet's health. That's why investing in green and circular economies is crucial to restore the balance between people and the planet and help countries recover. To promote sustainable lifestyles through sustainable sources of income, we at Green Oak Foundation have installed solar panels in Liberia so that the children can study at night and have safe spaces. In Bangladesh, we have been providing skills-based training on sustainable agriculture, sustainable fishing, and poultry, thereby creating local circular economies which benefit women the most. These challenges cannot be addressed by any single government or institution acting alone. They require collaborative actions among governments, international organizations, universities, NGOs, and creative individuals. We need a serious focus on green growth, rising food, water, energy prices, population growth, resource de depletion, climate change, and terrorism. Otherwise, the results may well as be catastrophic. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. You bring forth a very important point that, that is bridging the opportunity gap, addressing our socioeconomic order and seeing how we can really rebuild our infrastructure so that it's not just broken down by something like the pandemic. Rather, our infrastructure is what helps us to address issues that the pandemic and uh, everything else brings about. So thank you for that. And yes, as human beings, we are extremely dependent on our ecosystems. And we have to recognize how interconnected our economy, society, and environment are, which of course forms the basis of sustainability. Thank you, uh, Pragna. And now, I would. we are now in the World Interfaith Harmony Week. We're celebrating this amazing week. So I'd like to ask the both of you, how do you see World Interfaith Harmony Week bringing people together to rebuild better? So Pravna, let's begin with you. The World Interfaith Harmony Week is the perfect occasion to come together as a society, despite our differences. Building trust and collaborative partnership within different communities and ensuring a peaceful, sustainable, and just world is the bedrock for achieving the UN mandate of leaving no one behind. And this week provides us the ideal foundation. It highlights the importance of looking beyond race, ethnicity, and religion. In a world of increasing political and economic dissonance, peaceful coexistence among practitioners of various religious beliefs can prove to be the way forward for peace and prosperity. Especially during these dire times, faith has imparted a sense of hope and resilience among people, helping them positively cope with distress. This week has also enabled us to re realize the spiritual dimension to the issues. Knowing our place in the context of the biosphere and feeling a responsibility to it could become fundamental aspects of human morality. This moral responsibility has to be the reason for the conservation of the environment and the protection of biodiversity. Increasing tolerance and respect for one another and nature is imperative for rebuilding better. Back to you, Kekusha. Thank you, Pratna. Yes, absolutely. Very important points brought forth once again. Kusumita, the floor is yours. Um, well, th uh, thank you. Um, 
World Interfaith Harmony Week is really a, a visionary global project and uh, King Abdullah and others who founded it want it to be a global uh, movement. So every year in the first um, uh, week of February, um, those who launched um, this initiative would like not hundreds, but thousands and even millions of local observances to take place. And, and this I know from going to the UN Secretariat and you know to a big formal observance where uh, that's why they give a prize, you know, for the which Miriam will speak about for the best observance. So if you gather a few people together for uh, of different uh, traditions together for a breakfast and uh, offer prayers for peace and, and eat together, that will count as an observance, uh, just as our conversation for one hour today counts as an observance of World Interfaith Harmony Week. But uh, uh, this needs to be um, multiplied um, exponentially across the world. Um, and there was a time when um, interfaith was, there's always been interaction between people of different religious traditions, but it wasn't um, a, a, a movement. And um, a movement is something that can spread because people share values. They don't need a central headquarters or money flowing from one source, but people just understand a method and they share an ethics and therefore it can just spread without instructions from some power center or higher up authorities, if you see what I mean. And what is it that enables interfaith to spread? Today, it's thousands and thousands of organizations, groups, projects, activities all across the world, possibly tens of thousands. And, um, and it's because um, the, the world's religions are joined by uh, the, if you research the ethics of the world's religions, they do share certain basic moral values. And the parliament's signature document is the uh, declaration toward a global ethic. And it is based on research into the world's um, religious traditions. And it's also closely related to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, which was adopted by the UN in 1948, and the Earth Charter, um, and, and referring to what Pragmya was saying, um, the Earth Charter says that fulfillment is not about having more, but about being more, you know, in, in other words, um, how we live our lives in terms of consumption and, and experiences that fulfill us other than consumption. So, um, I just, uh, uh, I don't wanna take uh, more time. So let me just say that this sort of essential value here is that every human being is worthy of respect. That is uh, the basic principle of human rights is human dignity. Every human being is worthy of respect or in the words of the global ethic, every human being must be treated humanely. Every human being is, is of, is of value, of intrinsic value. And um, the Earth Charter refers to the community of all life. The human community is uh, situated uh, within the Earth community of all life. And part of the reason for the pandemic is that our relationship to the natural world, to the community of all life has been broken and needs to be restored. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kusumita. And what you just said about respect for all and dignity for all, that is exactly what the SDGs mandate, a life of dignity for all, where no one is left behind. So thank you for uh, sharing that with us. And I would now like to pose this question to all of you in the audience. So thank you, Kusumita, for the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, please read it. <laughs> yeah, I echoed that statement. So yes, to our wonderful audience members, please share with us your perspectives on how you see World Interfaith Harmony Week bringing to people together to build better together. 